The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now I should like to introduce a representative of our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Your future is his business. Security in years to come for you, your home, and your family. Tonight, our equitable representative has a very timely message for the fathers and mothers of America. New Year's Day is a time for good resolutions, a time for mothers and dads to face facts and plan a better future for their children. To help you do just that, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared its famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. In about 14 minutes, Mr. Keating is going to tell you just what this equitable chart can do for you and your children. May I suggest that you listen carefully. Don't miss a word of this interesting and important message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, Bank Robbery Incorporated. Despite the fact that American newspapers, magazines, and radios give the public more information about crime than the people of any other nation receive, there are still those among us who believe that criminals hide in dark alleys and plot their infractions in the light of glittering candles in dark basements. As J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, recently said, crime has moved upstairs, and until all of us realize it, it will continue to thrive in its new surroundings. The records of the Federal Bureau of Investigation show that almost every notorious criminal has spent a good deal of his time relaxing in the company of respectable people, people who accepted him as one of their own. For your own protection, your FBI asks you not to forget that crime is ever at your very elbow. It may be at the next table in your favorite restaurant, or jostling you on the dance floor. It may be your partner at bridge or at golf. It can be your guest or your genial host. For as we live our complicated lives today, we meet more people than we can possibly get to know. If you regard those statements as exaggerations or as propaganda put forth to frighten you, then listen to the story taken from one of the files of your FBI. The file on a man who became known to law enforcement agencies throughout the country as one of the shrewdest, most resourceful, and dangerous bank robbers in the history of the nation. Tonight's file opens in the office of the Henderson Importing Company, an office located in the downtown skyscraper. Two men have just entered and approach a desk at which is seated a gray-haired, distinguished-looking man. He greets them. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello, Ed. This is Artie Davis. Hi. Hello. hello. Davis is okay, Ed. He was sent to us by Fat Webster. That's enough recommendation. How is your Fat? Oh, he's swell. Comes up for parole next year. Good man, Fat. Yeah. Yeah. He told me just before I got out to come see Pete here. He said that you could set up a job for me. I might. What did you have in mind? A bank. How big? Well, not too big, but not too small. Uh-huh. Just a minute. I think I've got just a thing for you. Uh-huh. Here it is. Oh, let me see that. Uh -huh. Not yet. We have something to discuss first. Sure. Ed ain't doing this because he likes that, you know. Oh, yeah. You're in, huh? Exactly. Now, my fee for this job is 20%. Well, how much is in this job? Oh, on a weekday, you should get about $23,800. Well, that would mean your cut is... Uh... $4,760. <laughs> That's a lot of money. I have expenses. You know, it takes time to draw up these maps, to set up getaway charts, to fix a plan. Yeah, look, could you make it 10%? I'm sorry, I have one fee. Take it or leave it. Well, okay, I'll take it. Fine. 
Now, here. Here, this is the layout of the bank. One guard, he stands here. One cashier right here. Yeah, yeah. And one office at this end. Uh, you can read the rest of it yourself. Yeah, okay. And these, these are the getaway charts. <laughs> they look big. They are. Here are the roads leading away from the Crawford National Bank. Every curve is marked. Every obstruction, every detour. Mm -hmm. Double X means a dangerous curve. The number tells you how fast you can take it. Triple A means a back road. Use them unless it rains. Yeah. Now, uh, here. You take this, go home, and set it in both. Okay. When do you figure on doing this job? Tomorrow. The next afternoon at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches a fellow agent's desk. Hi, Irving. Oh, hello, Been Jim. Been looking for you. No, what for? New job or on? Crawford National Bank was knocked over this morning. The one at Elmville? Yeah, that's right. Anything to work on? A few leads. It was a three-man job. One man carried a machine gun. They used three women who were customers as shields in their exit. And how much did they get? $23,600. Hmm. You said we had a few leads, Jim. What are they? Now, one of the women used as a shield was able to remember the license number on the getaway car. Good. The Elmville police have already sent an alarm on it. Uh-huh. The other lead is only tentative. One of the clerks gave us a description of a man with a machine gun. And what's tentative about it? Well, he's not too sure about a couple of items. I'm getting some pictures from the file for him to examine. Well, if we come up with one description, Jim, we might be able to guess who the other two men are. Huh? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, Irv. This one has its unusual angle. Like what? The same modus operandi has been used a half a dozen times in the last couple of years in bank robberies. Here? Here and elsewhere. Why couldn't it be the same trio? Well, the Cleveland office arrested three men last year for the robbery of a small bank where the job was done the same way. They confessed. Well, they're not doing time. Could be one huge gang, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I guess it could have. But we've made arrests in a few of the cases. It doesn't seem possible the men even knew each other. Well, that is an odd angle. You know, at first I thought maybe it was a mastermind who hired different thieves to do each job. But, well, that went out of the window, too. Why? Two jobs were pulled within an hour's time of each other, a thousand miles apart. Oh. Well, have your desk clean? Well, as soon as I finish that report on the stolen car ring. Okay, can you finish that up today? Mm-hmm. Good. I'll go out and show the pictures to that bank clerk. If he makes a positive ident, we'll start from there. Hi, Dad. Gee, you're just in time. Come here, I need you. <laughs> need me for what, son? Come on, get down here on the floor. Well, okay. <clears throat> there we are. Now what? Now you got to play the game with me. Uh, what's that? Train robber. I've been playing it by myself. It's a little hard on account of I can't be a robber and a sheriff at the same time. <laughs> How does the game go? Well, we wait till the train gets in front of the tunnel. Then I stop it. Like this. See? Mm-hmm. See those guys there? Those matches? Dad, those are train robbers. Oh, oh. Now, they sneak up on the train and they rob all the money. Uh-huh. Then, when they start to get away, the sheriff sees them. That's him up there. The pipe cleaner? Yeah. Now, you be the train robber and I'll be the sheriff. Ed, right. I didn't know you were home, dear. Well, I hit a detour in here. Good evening, Dad. <laughs> I don't like to hurry you, but I think you better be changing your clothes. We're dining with the Williams tonight. Oh, yes, of course. I, I forgot all about it. Oh, gee, Mom. Dad's going to play a game with me. Well, come on, Dad. Changing clothes can wait. All right, son. We'll have one game. Oh, I'll get it. <clears throat> Hello? Ed? Yes? This is Pete. I just heard from Marty Davis. The bank job went okay. Oh, that's fine. He's holed up in a motel out in Ocean Avenue. I'm going out there now to get our dough. You want it tonight? Uh, no, no. Bring it to the office tomorrow and send a cable to that effect. Huh? Have them answer me at my cable address. Oh, I get it. Uh, this is double talk for the family. Right. Okay. See you tomorrow, then. So long. Goodbye. Who was that, dear? Oh, one of the men at my office. Dad, are you ready to play now? Uh, yes, son. Yes, I'm ready. Only, how about letting me be the sheriff, huh? <laughs> I think we made some progress on the Crawford bank robbery. We so did the police. They found a getaway car. Oh, where? Abandoned on Route 63. Had a flat tire and no spare, so I guess the bandits just up and left it. Any prints in it? A few. They're being checked by ident. But we got more than prints, Jim. Hmm? We found the whole setup. You mean the loot? No, but everything else. 
The machine gun and the plans for the robbery. The, the written plans? Mm-hmm. Full specifications. Wait till I show you. Yeah. Take a look at these. Oh. These things look like they were drawn up by an architect. <laughs> Wait till you see the getaway chart. They're even more complete. Irv, Irv, this doesn't add up. Add up to one. You remember those pictures I took out to the bank clerk to examine? Mm-hmm. Well, he identified one. Said it was definitely one of the bandits. Well, whose picture was it? Well, that's what puzzled me. He identified a Louis Green. Louis Green? Yeah, Green is a petty larceny $2 crook who never got beyond the eighth grade. Well, then he didn't make up those times. No, no, and neither did anybody he was ever arrested with. I checked a complete record. Well, that kind of makes your theory stand up a little better, Jim. Oh, you mean the mastermind? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it also makes that theory look ridiculous. How can we reconcile a mastermind hiring Louis Green? <laughs> I see what you mean. Well, where am I having an old address of Green's check now? If we pick him up, maybe we can get the answers to some of these questions. Yes, are you down there? Uh, yes, dear, I'll answer it. Hi, Ann. Pete, you know better than to come to my home. Well, it's important. I told you that my wife and child know nothing about my activities. But it's about the dough from Artie Davis. Who is it, dear? Uh, a messenger for me. Oh. Artie Davis is handing us one. Shh, quiet. But he only... Oh, come inside. Okay. Come on, let's go into my study. Hey, quite a scatter you got here. Save the comments. Go ahead in. Right. Now, what is it? What's wrong? I went to see Auntie Davis. All he gave me was 2,000 bucks. Why? He said that's all your cut came to. He said they got less than 12,000. He's a liar. That's what I told him. I said Ed predicted they'd get 23 grand. That's what he did get. How do you know? Pete, one of my services is to guarantee my clients the amount they'll steal. This guarantee is based on certain indisputable facts, financial facts that are arrived at by reading the bank's own statements. Oh, now, go back and see Ollie Davis. Yeah, but what'll I tell him? Well, say that I want the rest of the money. And if he don't pay? Use other means. Well, how far can I go? If necessary, you can kill him. Ed? Uh, yes, dear? Can you go upstairs? Bobby wants to kiss you goodnight. <laughs> All right, dear. I'll be right up. Turn in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now a quick interview with a man who's looking as happy as the proverbial king. A man who's going to tell us how he got rid of a 10-year worry in three easy moves. It was that easy, Mr. Keating. Move number one, I asked my Equitable Society representative for the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers you've been talking about on this program. Move number two, I got the chart. Move number three... I took ten minutes to fill in the chart according to directions. And right then and there, I realized that ten-year worry had been nothing but a ten-year bluff. What do you mean, Dick? Well, like most fathers, Mr. Keating, I was worried about what would happen to my family if I should die unexpectedly. And like so many fathers, that worry had me so thoroughly bluffed that I just dodged the whole issue. For instance, I never even figured up what my monthly income my family would need without me. That's why the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart was just what the doctor ordered for me. Let me explain to our listeners just how this fact-finding chart works. It was designed to give a man a sound and reliable basis for figuring up the minimum income his family would need for a comfortable living in case of his debt. Every item, food, rent, clothes, amusements, and so on, is provided for. And every step of the way is made clear by simple, easy-to-understand pictures. Well, after my wife and I filled in the chart at turned out that I'd been worrying over a problem that wasn't really hard to lick. As I said before, I'd been bluffed into doing nothing. Actually, with my Social Security and the life insurance I already owned, only a moderate amount of additional insurance protection was necessary. My equitable representative worked out the whole thing for me. Uh, just one thing more, Dick. How much did you pay for the fact-finding chart? Pay? Why, it was free. Yes, this chart is just one of many services available from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. It costs you nothing and does not obligate you in any way. Just drop a hint to any representative of the Equitable Society, 
and he'll be glad to see that you get a copy. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's spelled E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Bank Robbery Incorporated. Every law enforcement agency has a multitude of problems. But perhaps the one which is most difficult is their attempt to make the public understand the workings of the criminal mind. The average person does not believe the truth, which is that the criminal among us does his reasoning by entirely different standards than the decent citizen. It should be remembered that a true lawbreaker, a man like the one we call Edward Henderson in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, is nearer to the instincts by which beasts live, the predatory habits, the inherent instincts of escape. In animal life, they take the form of visual camouflage. In the criminal, the transposition is metal. He changes his viewpoint to suit his desires, to suit his ego. And while his attitudes change, his goal in life remains constant. He wants to get something for nothing something that does not belong to him. Because he thinks the way he does, the answer to his problem quickly comes to mind. He wants something, he takes it. That's where his ego helps. For now, he justifies taking what didn't belong to him, justifies it on various grounds, justifies it even when he is apprehended by saying, I did not stop to think. That alibi has been used so often it has virtually become the criminal's motto. Actually, it is incomplete, for the complete criminal motto should read, I did not stop to think of anyone but myself. The night's file continues the next morning at the FBI field office. Special Agent Taylor has just entered. Irv, we nailed Louis Green. Good. Right after I relieved the night shift, he came home. Oh, what did he have to say? Well, nothing at first. He was too surprised. Then he told it all. Including who his partners were? Yeah. He said he did the job with a George Wilson and an out-of-towner named Artie Davis. Well, I know Wilson, Jim. He's like Louis Green, strictly petty larceny. Davis must be the one who drew those plans. No, no, he bought them. Well, how do you know? Green told me. He didn't know who he got them from, but he said Davis mentioned paying 20% of the take for them. Well, then your theory about the mastermind is right. Yeah, yeah, which leaves one big problem. Who is he? I thought the lab might help us find that answer. No word back on the paper those plans were drawn on, huh? Uh, not yet. They said they'd rush it through to us, though. Mm -hmm. Jim, uh, what made Louis Green spill so much? Well, he didn't start until I found about $4,000 in his pocket. Some of it was new money from the Crawford National Bank. Uh, did he tell you where the other two were? Yes, they're living in a motel down by the beach. He didn't know the name of it, though. There are hundreds of them down that way, Jim. Yeah, I know. And the police are making a quick check for us now. As soon as they find the right place, I'll get down there. <laughs> Busy in? Oh, hello, Pete. Come on in. Right. Well, how'd you make out? See this bag? Yes. It ain't full of sawdust. <laughs> Good boy. Do you have any trouble? A uh, little. You had to slow them. How bad? Oh, nothing serious. Just tap them up. Yeah, take a look at this. Well, is it all in one? No, those are big bills. That's more than 4700 Sure, I took the whole thing. That was wrong. Huh? I've got $4,760 coming. Count out that amount, and I want the rest returned. Are you kidding? No. Well, look, I don't get this. Have I ever shortchanged you? No. Or anybody you know? No. Pete, I'm not in the cheating business. That's why men like Fat Webster don't talk to cops about me when they're caught. They know I'm on the level. I can't afford to lose that reputation. Yeah, but you told me to kill the guy if necessary. That has nothing to do with principle. Now get the rest of this money back to Davis. Are you 
signing in or out, Earth? Uh, signing out, Jim. Oh? The lab sent a report on the paper that was used in the robbery plan. Oh, good. It was manufactured by the Allen Paper Company of Boston. Well, it might not be too tough to locate the dealer, then, huh? I hope not. How'd you make out in the motel? I'm not sure myself. Hmm? Artie Davis wasn't around, but as I was looking through his room, someone came in. The third man in the act? No, not George Wilson. This bird's name is Pete Marshall. Marshall? What's he got to do with the case? Well, that's what I'd like to figure out. He had about $6,000 of the stolen money on him, so I arrested him. Maybe Louis Green was lying. Maybe this Marshall was the third member. No, no, he couldn't have been. He told me he was in traffic court all day yesterday answering a ticket. Well, I checked her. He was. Mm. How do you account for the money? He said a friend asked him to hold it for him. What friend? Oh, he couldn't remember the name. He knew I didn't believe him, but he didn't seem to care. Mm. Could he be the mastermind? No, no, not in a million years. Well, we're getting no place fast in this case. Yeah. Well, I better get going. I'll check back here with you, Jim, as soon as I get a break. Hello? Ed. Uh, yes, Frank? Ed, something terrible is happening. What is it? A man came to see you. A very hard-looking man. When? About half an hour ago. What did he look like? Oh, I don't know. He was tall, had a badly broken nose. Arnie Davis. Who is he? Oh, uh, a fellow importer. But he acted like a gangster. He didn't believe me when I told him you weren't here. Is he still there? Yes. He's in his car. It's parked across the street. He said he'd wait for you. Oh, Ed, I'm frightened. It's all right, dear. But, Ed... Blanche, if it'll make you feel any better, I'll come home right now. I think we're getting someplace now, Jim. You trace the paper, Irv? Uh-huh. The Bedford Printing Supply Company is the only one in town that handles paper from that firm in Boston. Oh. I checked the books with him and found that the paper with the plans on them was from a new shipment. Hey, that's a good break. It had only been sold to three stores so far. I checked them and found that a man answering to the description of that Pete Marshall picked up two packages of the paper a couple of days ago. Well, that ties him in. But we're still at least one link away from the central figure in this thing. Who are Marshall's friends? Well, if you mean who has he been arrested with, I can tell you. His record shows four arrests. All of that Fred Jenkins. Mm. Could Jenkins be the man we're looking for? I checked on him, Irv. He's been in jail for three years now. Mm, well, that takes him off the list. Well, let's face it, Irv. We've got no list of suspects. Mr. X in this case could be anybody. Have you talked to Marshall again? Yes, he's not telling anything to anybody. Now, if we want to find out who he works for, we've got to get it from these things that are on my desk. Mm, what are they? Oh, this is stuff that Marshall had in his pockets when I arrested him. Oh, let me look at it. A driver's license. Gasoline credit card. That letter you got there is from some girl. I, I checked on her. She has a car out, but I drive it. Oh. So, wait a minute. Hmm? What's this written on the back of the envelope? Oh, as close as I can make it out, it says, In Imco. Well, what could that mean? Your guess is as good as mine. Could be anything. An Imco. Hmm. Well, it's not a word. No. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why didn't I think of this before? <laughs> Yes, dear. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I thought you said that man was in a car across the street. He was. I decided to come inside. Oh. Eddie practically forced his way in here. I tried to stop him. Oh, that's all right, dear. Mr. Davis has some business to discuss with me. Yeah, that's right. Uh, won't you come into my study? Yeah, sure. But, Ed. Please, he's... dear. Everything is all right. Now, just run along upstairs. I'll be through with Mr. Davis in just a minute. Go ahead, Davis. Okay. Now, what's the meaning of this? Take one guess. You mean the treatment you got from Pete? Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I bet you are. That's why I sent him back with the rest of your money. What are you talking about? I took my cut out and sent the rest back to you. I never got it. Well, there must be some mistake. If there was, there ain't gonna be any more. That gun is unnecessary. It'll help. Now, give me my dough. Ed, they're here. Huh? The police are outside. Outside? What for? Well, I called them. What? It wasn't really necessary, Mrs. Henderson. We were coming here anyway. Now, let's all take a little ride down to headquarters. (laughs) 
Edward Henderson was tried and convicted for a bank robbery and sentenced to 25 years. Artie Davis received a sentence of 20 years. Pete Marshall, Lou Green, and George Wilson received sentences of 10 years each, all to be served in a federal penitentiary. The clue which led to the solution of tonight's case from the files of your FBI was the complicated word, Hanimco, spelled H-E-N-I-M-P-C-O. Special Agent Taylor surmised that it might be a cable address, and a call to the cable company proved him to be right. Proved the word to be the cable address of the Henderson Importing Company. Investigation at the office of the company showed two sets of files, one containing legitimate business correspondence the other filled with plans for still other bank robberies. Plans which Edward Henderson would now never get to sell. Henderson's failure, and the failure of many thieves, confidence men, murderers, and other assorted criminals, is a mirror of the success of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and of the men who comprise that organization. This week, one of those men, a man named J. Edgar Hoover, celebrates his birthday. The 33rd birthday he has spent in the field of law enforcement in the service of his fellow citizens. In fact, since his graduation from school, he has had no other employer than you, the people. His rise through the ranks to become the director of the your FBI has been the rise of one who did his job, who did the work assigned to him and more besides. On this occasion, then, we would like publicly to thank Mr. Hoover for those years of service on our behalf and to offer him as a birthday salute the simple phrase, you have served your people well. In just a moment, you will hear about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But first... A few words from our Equitable Society representative. Have you said to yourselves, I'm going to get that fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers the Equitable Society has printed? Well, don't let this be one of those New Year's resolutions that's forgotten almost as soon as it's made. Phone one of us Equitable Society representatives early next week for your copy of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this radio station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A retelling of crime in the turbulent 20s. Its subject, gang war. Its title, Yesterday's Killers. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Sonny Barnett, Tony Barrett, Ted DeCorsia, Bill Johnstone, Wally Mayer, and Janet Nolan. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yesterday's killers on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.